Robert Patterson tells a story and it goes like this. It was the year 320 AD when an elite regiment of Roman soldiers marked across the frozen tundra of Armenia. This was the elite thundering regiment that had formed a line of defense protecting the Roman Empire from the invading Persian army. But a new threat came against the Roman Empire and this threat was Christianity. The emperor, emperor, fearing the threat, decreed that all soldiers of Rome must sacrifice to pagan gods. The order came to the thundering regiment and all obeyed, except for 40 men who refused. Their superiors cried out, how dare you refuse? You bring shame upon this elite unit. But they replied, it would be worse still if we were to bring shame to Jesus Christ. These men were taken and beaten with whips and hooks, and still they refused. The 40 men were then stripped naked and sent out onto a frozen lake. Tubs of hot water were placed on the edges to tempt them to recant. None of them would give up. Then suddenly one of them ran naked to one of the tubs and jumped in. The shock to his system meant that he died instantly. So there were only 39. But one of the legionnaires, moved by their courage, stripped off his armor and ran naked onto the lake to join them. Again, there were 40. And they were left on the ice overnight, and the next day the commander ordered their frozen bodies to be burned. Now they were shocked to find one of the men still alive, but he still refused to recant. So they buried, or they burned the last man alive with the rest who were frozen. The witness of the 31 brought one to salvation. And the story of this courageous event spread across the empire. And four years later, Constantine I, disgusted by the barbaric treatment of these men, ordered the emperor who did this to be executed. Later, moved by these events, Constantine became a Christian. And Christianity became the favored religion of Rome. It was a single act of bravery that changed the course of history. Humility mixed with boldness while contending for the faith made a difference. And it is to this that we are called. I'm continuing our series today on the book of Jude. And I want to talk to you for a little while about standing firm in the faith. And I'm reading today from Jude uh, 3 through to verse 13. And I ended last week's message with verse 3, but I'm going to read it again. It says, Dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt I had to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to all the saints. For certain men whose condemnation was written lo about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They're godless men who changed the grace of our God into a license for immorality and denied Jesus Christ, our only sovereign and Lord. And though you already know all this, I want to remind you that the Lord delivered his people out of Egypt but later destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not keep their positions of authority, but abandoned their own home because he has kept, these have been kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains for judgment on the great day. In a similar way, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns gave themselves up to sexual immorality and perversion, and they serve as an example of those who suffer the punishment of eternal life, or eternal fire. In the very same way, these dreamers pollute their own bodies, reject authority, and slander celestial beings. beings. But even the archangel Michael, when he was disputing with the de devil about the body of Moses, did not dare to bring a slanderous accusation against him, but said, the Lord rebuke you. Yet these men speak abusively against whatever they do not understand, and what things they do understand by instinct, like unreasoning animals, these are the very things that destroy them. Woe to them! They have taken the way of Cain, they have rushed for profit into Balaam's error, 
They have been destroyed in Korah's rebellion. These men are blemishes at your love feasts, eating with you with, without the slightest qualm. Shepherds who feed only themselves. They are clouds without rain, blown along by the wind. Autumn trees without fruit and uprooted, twice dead. They are wild waves of the sea, foaming up their shame. Wandering stars for whom the blackest darkness has been reserved forever. I want to share with you from this passage of scripture today, a few, um, a few thoughts that I think can be transformational in our own personal walk with God. They serve as a challenge. They also serve as a warning. They look back and they also look forward. They look back at history, but they look forward to the future. And the first challenge that I want to share about today is the challenge to contend for the faith. Now, last week we talked about how uh, Jude was wanting to uh, write about salvation. He said, I wanted to share, uh, to share about the salvation that we share. But he says, I felt I needed to urge you instead to contend for the faith. And he goes on to give some very stern warnings about false teachers. And we recognize it's a 2,000 year old problem. It has been in the church from the beginning of time. And it's interesting to note that as you go through the New Testament, you will find Jesus speaking out against false teaching. You will find Paul doing it. You will find others doing it as well. And we now uh, lump Jude in with that esteemed crowd of people who, who call out false teaching and who call out false teachers. And why, why do that? It would seem to be unkind. It would seem to be impolite. But the fact of the matter is, is the stakes are really high and the need to call out false teaching is so important because it, it can affect people's eternity. It can affect the state of their soul. And in verse 4, it says that certain men have slipped in among you. And it goes on to talk about how they change the grace of God to a license for immorality. Now, we do have a message of grace. We do have a message of mercy. And, and every believer, anybody that's going to follow Christ, absolutely depends on, on him for his grace, for his mercy for his forgiveness. But there is this fine line that we are careful not to cross where we use the grace of God as a license to continue in sin. We don't use it um, like an, immu an immunization shot, you know, where you take the shot and then you carry on with life as you would before having the shot, but you're protected. You've been immunized and, and that's your, your ticket to ride, so to speak. That's not what the grace of God is. It is not a, a shot of God's grace so that we can then continue to live life as we always did before we knew Christ. That's not what the grace of God is about. When people use the grace of God as a license to sin or a license for immorality. It really is a denial of Christ and the Lordship of Jesus Christ in our lives. It's denying the Lordship of Christ. It is, it is denying the Lordship of Jesus Christ as our Lord, as our Savior, as our healer, as our forgiver, as our master. It's denying him of all of that. When Jesus is Lord of our lives, it is our inclination to turn from sin. It is our desire to turn from wickedness and immorality. It is our inclination to take up the cross and be a follower of Jesus. But a false teacher would say, no, you can have it all. 
You can have all that the flesh desires, everything the world has to offer, and you can be partakers of the grace of God. Denying the Lordship of Jesus Christ and depending on his grace is not the way to go. It's a very different picture from 40 men standing naked on a frozen lake refusing to bow to any other God for the sake of Jesus Christ. I want to talk secondly about a recipe for disaster. When we look at verse 5 to 7, the Jude uses some Old Testament examples of, of people who, who lost their way and, and fell, who started out good, but lost their way along the journey. He talks about he talks about the children of Israel who fell by the wayside, who never entered the promised land. Why? Because of their unbelief. He talks about angels who rebelled against God, who are kept in darkness, bound in chains, waiting for judgment. He also talks about Sodom and Gomorrah, famous for their immorality and perverse ways. And speaks of them as an example of the punishment of eternal fire. Now Jude uses these three examples to remind us that we serve a God of justice. We serve a God who holds mankind accountable. And reminds us that we can go on our way and do our own thing and act as though God doesn't exist. We can just write him out of the script of our life. We can do that. But scripture is clear that at some point he does judge sin and disobedience. And so while the world races headlong into a life without God, into a post-Christian belief system, in a world that would shirk the authority of God's word and God's teaching, when evil is called good and good is called evil, we need to know for sure that when we're racing toward those things, we are racing toward judgment. It's very clear in Scripture. Jude uses some examples from the Old Testament and issues it as a warning for us today that God will ultimately have the final say. And then we look at Jude 8 to 13. And I want to talk for a few minutes, thirdly, about the high stakes of rebellion. Jude continues to warn the church here in these verses. And he, he talks about these false teachers and he says, you know, they're dreamers. These false teachers are dreamers. And how would we explain that today? Well, a dreamer, a false teacher who's a dreamer is going to come up with things like, this is a new revelation. I have a new revelation. And in their, in their fanciful world's mind, world's view, they will see their revelations as being more important than what the Word of God says. In some extreme cases, even replacing or contradicting what the Word of God says. Imagining things. Their knowledge, their interpretation would oftentimes be contradictory to pure doctrine found in the scriptures. They would maybe use phrases like, you know, we were wrong in the past. They would opt for a feel-good theology. They would be blown by winds of doctrine. Trying to uh, nail down their belief systems would be like, nailing jello to a wall because what they're believing and preaching today may be the latest fad but tomorrow we'll be on to something new dreamers they're sexually immoral he talks about these ones who slipped in as being sexually immoral we know people by their fruit how they live 
not by what they just profess, not just by what they say or not just by what they teach, but by how they live, the fruit of their lives. And then he goes on to talk about how they reject authority. They would reject scriptural authority. They may reject any form of authority in their own life where uh, any systems of accountability would be removed and they're on their own and they really answer to no one. Unsubmitted, unaccountable. He talks about how they would feed only themselves. They, they look to profit themselves, to, to do well, while they starve God's people of the truth of God's word. And then it talks about how they would blaspheme God, claim to follow God, claim to teach the word of God, but in reality, doing the very opposite, living in rebellion to God, taking the word of God and twisting it or watering it down. And the high stakes are this. When you look at verse 13, it says, that the blackest darkness has been reserved for them forever. Wow. Just let that settle into your mind for a moment. That the blackest darkness has been reserved for them forever. Some commentators would say there is a place in hell reserved for them. That is high risk. Now, you don't have to look real hard for this stuff today. We're pretty much inundated with it. It's all around us. And there will be an increase of it in the last days, where there will be scoffers, where there will be mockers, where many will be led astray. And we need to be aware of that today and realize that the stakes are high for them and for us. And then we finally see that we are to continue contending in verse 14 to 16, it really challenges us to continue to contend for the faith. Um, Enoch, the seventh from, from Adam, prophesied about these men. See, the Lord is coming with thousands upon thousands of his holy ones to judge everyone and to convict all the ungodly of all the ungodly acts that they've done in the ungodly way and all the harsh words and godly sinners have spoken against him. These men are grumblers and fault finders. They follow their own evil desires and they boast about themselves and flatter others for their own advantage. Theological and spiritual battles are fierce today. I saw this coming uh, several years ago as uh, some denominations uh, we're experiencing this at their levels of leadership where liberal factions would move in and divide and separate the body of Christ and churches. There would be a push by some people today to, to accept sin, to deny long-held biblically sound theology, doctrines, and practices. There would be a push to redefine morals, to banish the word sin from our vocabulary, to minimize the reality of judgment or hell, to remove the necessity of evangelism by claiming that everyone is saved, a universalism type of theology. And we need to understand that this is ungodly. And Jude is clear in his address here that those who practice these things, grumblers and fault finders, are following their own evil desires and they're given to flattery to convince and to deceive other people. How do we how do we see the manifestation of a grumbler or a fault finder? You know, we're not talking about someone who has a meal served them and, and they touch it and they say, oh, this is too cold. No, we're not talking about that. A fault finder, a grumbler is going to 
marginalize and condemn and shame and say, you know, you, you're unloving, you're wrong, you're intolerant. You shouldn't be saying those things or believing those things. We were wrong in the past and we need to right the wrongs. They, they may be fault finders saying, you know, there's something wrong with you. There's something wrong with your belief system. And oftentimes the end game is to take advantage and to deceive people and to ultimately get their own way. If the end game, as it should be, is to point people to Jesus, we cannot and we must not compromise in the truth of God's word. We cannot and we must not tolerate false teaching and false teachers. And we cannot and we must not replace sound doctrine and the word of God for the latest ideas, fads, and fashions made up by dreamers and false teachers. The truth is, there will be times when you feel like you're very much alone. There will be times when you will feel like you are standing alone, naked, on the ice, standing for the truth. And while the masses watch, while the masses move on, while others may mock or beg you to come along with them, keep standing. Stand in the cold. It's worth it. And so as I close today, in 320 AD, 40 soldiers stood out on a frozen lake, refusing to turn from Christ, refusing to deny truth. 39 stood, one gave up, and one more joined them. They lost their lives, but they changed their world. A watered-down gospel will not change a light bulb. The truth of the gospel will shine the light in the darkest places and change the world. So I encourage you today, in your own personal walk, in your own personal life, to contend for the gospel and for the truth in your own life. To love those who don't know Christ and bring them to Jesus. Jesus didn't come to condemn the world. He came to save the world. Our concern would be those that would teach false doctrine. Not those who don't believe yet. Not those who haven't come to Christ. Those are the very ones that Jesus loves and gave his life for and died for. Let's bow in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word today. Thank you for all that it means to us. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that we would follow Christ and we would stay true to your word. And we would not accept a watered-down gospel or an easy gospel, but we would stand for the truth of your word. Help us, Lord, not to exchange your grace and your mercy for a license to sin and do our own thing, but help us to walk as followers of Jesus, taking up our cross, denying ourselves, and following him. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us. And uh, we're going to, at this time, move to communion. It's uh, Communion Sunday. And I hope that you're ready to join with me in this. And um, it's Palm Sunday as well. It's a time when we, <laughs> we celebrate the coming of Jesus before uh, Good Friday, before Easter Sunday, when people laid down palm branches and shouted Hosanna. And we celebrate Jesus 
hopefully every day in our lives. But we also recognize that we are reminded to remember the death and the resurrection of Jesus until he comes. And so we do that by taking communion together. And I'd like us to pray over the emblems today. Heavenly Father, thank you for the body and blood of Jesus that was broken and shed for us. Thank you for the forgiveness of sin we have by believing in you and confessing you as our Lord and Savior. Bless these emblems together now as we take them in Jesus' name. Amen. So Jesus was with his disciples and he took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's partake of the bread together. And the scriptures go on to say that after supper, Jesus took the cup and he said, this is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's partake of the cup together. We'd like to thank you for joining us today. And if you're looking for a church home, join us again every Sunday. We have a special feature this coming Sunday. If you click on this, or Friday, if you click on the same link that you did today, um, we have a special Good Friday service in conjunction with many other churches throughout Manitoba. We'll all be sharing together. And ours is going to be featured at 11 o'clock on Good Friday. You can also join us next Sunday at 11 o'clock for our presentation for Easter Sunday. If you want to join us in person, 1042 Jefferson Avenue in Winnipeg, we meet at 930 and 11, 10 a.m. God bless you. Happy Palm Sunday. And we look forward to seeing you again. Well, that was a great message from Pastor Jim. I hope that it helped you today. And if it left you wondering anything more about the gospel or about our church or any of that, you can find everything you need to know, including past messages, contacting a pastor. Um, if you'd like to give to our church, all of our church is funded by the donations and the generosity of people who attend. Or whatever it is that you're looking for, you can find everything you need to know at clcwinnipeg.ca. Thank you so much for joining us. Hope you have a great week and God bless you as you go.